Welcome to the webinar, Animal Kind Dog Training Standards, the Science. The aim of today's webinar is to describe the research done to support the development of the Animal Kind Dog Training Standards. The actual dog training standards can be found at the website link listed on this slide, which is www.animalkind.ca. The webinar today is composed of two main sections. In the first one, it was really we're going to do a scan of existing standards. We're going to have a look at what is already out there in terms of position statements or standards as they relate to dog training. In the second part, um, I will do a review of the scientific published literature on the effects of dog, dog training techniques. So let's start with the first one, looking at existing standards. For this part of the research, I reviewed 61 different organizations. And these organizations were in Canada, in the US, in the UK, in Australia, and in New Zealand. We covered a variety of different organizations, ranging from animal protection, such as SPCAs, veterinary organizations, such as the Canadian Veterinary Medical Association. Uh, we looked at dog trainer organizations, such as the Pet Professional Guild, um, kennel clubs, such as the CKC or Canadian Kennel Club. We looked at different dog training schools, such as Karen Pryor, Pryor Academy. We looked at service dog organizations, such as Assistance Dogs International. We looked at animal behavior societies, such as the Animal Behavior Society. And we also looked at legislation. And for this part, we also reached um, out to countries in the EU. So first things first, uh, we started with BCSPCA's own position statement on animal training which states that when training or handling animals, the BCSPCA advocates for the use of force-free, humane training techniques utilizing evidence-based learning theories which foster trust and build positive human-animal relationships. The statement further states that BCSPCA is opposed to training methods or devices which employ coercion and force. Aversive, punishment-based techniques may alter behavior, but the methods fail to address the underlying cause and, in the cause of unwanted behavior, can lead to undue anxiety, fear, distress, pain, or injury. And this position statement was approved by the Board of Directors in 2016. Different um, animal protection organizations have very similar position statements, um, and these include, for example, the Calgary Humane Society, the SPCA in Montreal, the RSPCA in the UK, um, RSPCA in Australia, PEI Humane Society. In terms of what uh, these statements look like from these different organizations, for example, the PEI Humane Society says that they rely on science-based research which has conclusively proven that positive, reward, and force-free based training methods are both more humane and more effective than training methods which involve intimidation, confrontation, violence, reprimands, or domination, or have the potential to cause physical or mental injury to the animals, causing potential danger to humans. The Montreal SPCA says that they oppose the use of physical corrections or punishment as well as psychological intimidation in animal training and instead support the use of force-free positive reinforcement based techniques. Very similar statements are also adopted by various dog trainer associations, and these include the PPG, the Pet Professional Guild, the Association of Pet Dog Trainers in the UK, and the APDT in Australia. The APDT UK, um, their statement says that the training methods and or equipment advised, employed, or sold by members shall be consistent with the principles of kindness and fairness to both clients and dogs. For this reason, coercive or punitive techniques and or equipment should not be used, recommended, advertised, or sold by members. Various veterinary associations also have similar position statements against the use of aversive-based methods. These include the CVMA, which is the Canadian Veterinary Medical Association, the AVA, the Australian Veterinary Association, as well as the British Small Animal Veterinary Association. And in terms of some of the language, um, the CVMA in Canada it states that the use of positive reinforcement alone has been found to be significantly associated with a lower number of undesirable behaviors and reduced aggression and fear or avoidance scores. 
In addition, there is evidence that it may improve a dog's subsequent ability to learn. Aversive training techniques create fear and therefore may increase the likelihood of fear-induced aggressive responses in dogs. The British Small Animal Veterinary Association says that they strongly recommend the use of positive reinforcement training methods that could replace those using aversive stimuli. The association recommends against the use of aversive methods for the training and the containment of animals. Finally, the Kennel Club in the UK, which is the oldest kennel club in the world, is also opposed to aversive-based methods. The language in their standard is that they are against the use of any negative training methods or devices. They believe that there are many positive training tools and methods that can produce dogs that are trained just as quickly and reliably with absolutely no fear, pain, or potential damage to the relationship between the dog and the handler. So all of these organizations spoke out against the general use of aversive-based techniques versus reward-based techniques. Um, some organizations have position statements relating to specific training tools. And specifically, these often are related to the use of electronic shock collars, prong collars, and choke collars or chains. So starting with shock collars, um, looking at the legislation around the world, um, we found that shock collars are actually illegal um, in nine countries listed here. The asterisk um, next to England and Scotland simply indicates that these countries are in the process of implementing their legislative bans. Um, shock collars are also legal in several parts of Australia. The SBC in Nova Scotia has a position statement against shock collars. They say that they do not support the use of shock collars for training as there are other viable, safe and proven training options available. The European Society of Veterinary Clinical Ethology um, has adopted a similar position statement after a long symposium. Their statement says that the members of the ESVCE position strongly against the use of e-collars in dog training. Not only is there no strong evidence to justify shock collar use on dogs, but on the contrary, there are many reasons to never use them. When it comes to prong collars, these are also illegal in four countries, um, plus um, in one state in Australia. Choke collars and chains are legal in two countries. The CVMA here in Canada, the Vet Medical Association, is also against the use of aversive devices such as choke, pinch, or prong collars. They are strongly discouraged in favor of more humane alternatives. In the UK, the Animal Behavior and Training Council said that prong collars are pieces of equipment that work on instilling anxiety or fear in the dog to make it behave, and that choke collars are outdated. Some organizations also have position statements against the use of anti-bark collars. For example, RSPCA in Australia says that they are opposed to the use of collars that deliver aversive stimuli such as sound or scent, including citronella collars and high-pitched sound-emitting devices. The RSPCA in South Australia states that citronella collars are used as a quick fix, but that they fail to address the underlying cause of the behavior and therefore have limited success. Finally, the Association of Pet Dog Trainers in the UK states, says that pet correctors emitting a hiss of cold air, remote controlled spray collars, anti-bark collars emitting spray directed onto the dog's skin, and high frequency sound devices, which are designed to startle, should not be used, recommended, advertised, or sold by members. All right, so this was a quick scan of some of the existing standards and legislation around the world um, around the use of different methods in dog training. What I'm going to do now is review some of the key scientific publications on this topic. So for this part of the research um, that was used to support the development of the standards, we reviewed and summarized 32 peer-reviewed scientific articles on the effects of different dog training methods on dog welfare and on dog's learning ability. So similarly to the position statements that we just looked at, um, the scientific articles fell in two broad categories. The first one was to look at the effects of reward-based versus aversive-based training methods in general. The second category of articles looked at specific training methods. So we're going to start with the first category. 
Before I go into some of what these studies looked at, I want to make sure that everybody understands what we mean by reward-based and aversive-based training methods. And for that, I'm going to do a little quick crash course on um, some of the learning theory used in training. So one of the common training methods it uses operant conditioning. Operant conditioning is, consists of basically four different methods. You have positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, positive punishment, negative punishment. I want to make sure that everyone here understands what these are. So when you hear positive, do not think positive as in good. Think of positive as in plus or add to add something. Similarly, when you hear negative, do not think of negative as in something bad, but think of as a subtraction to remove something. The word reinforcement is used to mean anything that increases a behavior or makes that behavior more likely in the future. And the word punishment is used to indicate anything that will decrease a behavior or to make that behavior less likely in the future. So for example, if I want to use, um, if I want to teach a dog to sit, um, so I want to increase sitting behavior, if I want to be using positive reinforcement, which would mean I would be adding something, for example, when the dog sits, I will give the dog a treat, um, so adding something to the dog that will then make that dog more likely to sit in the future because it got rewarded with something. If I want to teach the dog to sit, to increase sitting behavior using negative reinforcement, that means I'll be subtracting, subtracting something from the dog. So for example, I will release um, a pull on a choke chain. So when the dog sits, so does that behavior I want, I will release the choking, which should make the dog more likely to sit in the future in order to release that unpleasant experience. If I now want to decrease the behavior, so for this example, let's say your dog jumps at you when you come through the door after a long day. If I want to decrease that jumping up behavior to greet me using positive punishment, which means I'll be adding something to the dog, for example, I will pull on a choke chain. So when the dog jumps at me, I tighten that collar. It's unpleasant. The dog will stop jumping. Eventually, might not want to do that behavior because it's followed by something unpleasant. If I want to train the dog to stop jumping at me when I come through the door using negative punishment, I will be subtracting something. So for example, I will be subtracting or removing my attention, so I will ignore the dog. So when I come through the door, the dog jumps up at me, I will remove my attention, and eventually the dog will be less likely to jump at me because it gets ignored and it doesn't like that. All right, so just moving those quadrants uh, to the side. Um, I want to now bring back that whole concept of reward-based versus aversive-based training. So in general, when research studies look at reward-based training, what they mean are positive reinforcement and negative punishment techniques. When researchers talk about aversive-based training, generally they mean positive punishment and negative reinforcement techniques. One last little thing I want to show you, just so you understand all the language I will, you'll be seeing on the slides, is that positive reinforcement is often denoted with the symbol R+, plus, R for reinforcement, plus for positive. Negative reinforcement is R-, minus. positive punishment would be P+, plus, P for punishment, and negative punishment is a P-. Minus. All right, so here we have it. This is, in a nutshell, some of the basics of learning theory. Um, all of these describe the science of learning. And the really important thing to understand here is that all of these do work. All, you can use any of these methods to train your dog to do, to increase or decrease different behaviors. However, um, the crux of what we're gonna be talking about here is that the consequences to the dog, so the dog's experience while being trained to stop certain behaviors or do others will be very different depending on which of these techniques that you use. So this is what we're talking about when we talk about dog, the effects of training methods on welfare. All right, so I'm going to get into some of the details of some of the key studies that were done on this topic. So first I'm going to describe a study that used direct observation, which means that the researchers were in the room with dogs as they were being trained, um, and they were looking at the impact of these training methods on the dog's welfare. So in this research study that was done by Dildal and Gounet in 2014, 
They went to two different training schools. One of these schools taught dogs basic obedience using negative reinforcement, and the other school taught these dogs um, the same things but using positive reinforcement. So in these studies, this was intermediate obedience. These dogs had already been trained on these basic tasks previously several months before at these two different schools and now had graduated and came to this intermediate um, training school. In this class, the dogs were watched by the researchers while they were walking on leash and while they performed the sitting command. What the researchers found when the dogs were walking on leash is that there were no differences in behaviors or anything else between the two different groups. However, when the dogs were asked to sit, dogs who were trained to sit at the, negative re at the school that used negative reinforcement had lower posture, they displayed more lip licking, they displayed more yawning, and they were also more likely to show at least one of six different stress-related behaviors compared to the other dogs. What I want to emphasize here is, like I said, these dogs were already, these, these are basic tasks. These dogs were so told to sit and they sat, so no negative reinforcement was actually used during this research study. The dogs had been trained, they're already intermediate. So what this research suggests is that the verbal cue sit itself has become aversive to the dog. These dogs are displaying these stress-related behaviors even though nothing negative is happening to them at the moment. Um, it's these stress-related behaviors seem to persist from that experience when they originally were, were trained to use the using aversive methods. So another study that again consisted of direct observation of dogs while they were being trained um, and the effects of the different methods on welfare. In this study, Belgian military dogs were being trained on obedience and protection work. And the handlers of these dogs used a mixture of positive reinforcement and positive punishment techniques. What the researchers found is that during training, after the use of a positive punishment technique, the dogs had significantly lower posture than after the use of a positive reinforcement technique. So again, showing that this, this positive punishment was immediately followed by a stress-related behavior in the dog. What they also found, which is similar to what they found in the previous study, is that those, those dogs that were already trained, um, well trained, they were obedient, they were doing what they were asked to do, actually displayed more stress-related behaviors. So again, you have this indication that these verbal cues themselves, once they know them and they know what they mean, have become aversive. And even though nothing aversive is happening to them anymore, they are still stressed just by that verbal cue. Here's another study, again, using direct observations of dogs being trained. Um, and this time, the study looked at the effects of the different training techniques on dogs' ability to learn. So in this study, the, the researchers observed dog guardians or dog owners training their own dog on a novel task that they've never been trained on before. What the researchers found is that the learning ability was better for those dogs who were receiving more rewards during that training session in the lab. What they also found is that the learning ability was better for those dogs whose owners or guardians reported using more reward-based methods in the past with their dog in their homes. All right. So these were some of the studies on, that included direct observations of dogs in, in laboratories or during training sessions. The bulk of the research on dog training methods and their effects on welfare consists of surveys. Um, so what I want to say is that surveys can reveal associations rather than causality. So for example, if a survey finds that guardians who report using more punish positive punishment also report having more aggressive dogs, one explanation for that is that using positive punishment makes dogs more aggressive. However, an equally plausible explanation is that guardians who have aggressive dogs are more likely to resort to using positive punishment in an attempt to eliminate this aggressive behavior. 
so we don't know which way that relationship goes. However, what we do know if we have this binding is that using positive punishment has not proven effective in eliminating the aggression. Because here you are, you have aggressive dogs and you are using positive punishment. Whatever the case may be, the positive punishment has not eliminated that behavior because they're still both present. All right, so I'm going to go through some of the findings of these surveys, um, asking people about the different methods that they've used and some of the welfare effects seen in their dogs. Um, so throughout this little bit, on the left, you're going to have um, guardians who report using X, Y, or Z technique or method also reported having X, Y, or Z behaviors in their dogs. So Casey et al. conducted two studies using a really large sample size in the UK. And what they found is that people who reported using positive punishment or negative reinforcement also reported their dogs as being two and a half times more aggressive towards other dogs, 2.9 times more aggressive towards family members, and 2.2 times more aggressive towards strangers. Other research by Arhant et al., Blackwell et al., and Hibby et al. together found that people who reported using positive reinforcement also reported the fewest problem behaviors in their dogs and the least aggression in their dogs. People who reported using only positive punishment or positive punishment together with any of the other techniques also reported more aggression and more behavior problems in their dogs. These surveys that I'm going to describe now, again, asked owners what they used, but this time they were asking owners on some of the learning outcomes and learning ability. So these studies found that people who reported using positive punishment also reported lower obedience in large dogs, which were quantified as weighing more than 20 kilos in this study. They also found that people who used positive punishment, negative reinforcement, or negative punishment never reported any of these three methods as being the most effective method for, for teaching a dog a basic training task, such as to sit. People who reported using positive reinforcement also reported their dogs as being the most obedient. And finally, what these researchers found is that people who reported using more rewards relative to all other methods also reported better obedience in their dogs. Just last year, in 2017, two large peer-reviewed um, review papers were published on the topic of training methods and their effects on dogs. So the first one that I'm going to describe is one by Ziv, 2017. Um, the title was The Effects of Using Aversive Training Methods in Dogs. What this researcher found as a conclusion after reviewing all the scientific literature on dog training is that the results show that using aversive training methods, example positive punishment and negative reinforcement, can jeopardize both the physical and mental health of dogs. In addition, although positive punishment can be effective, there is no evidence that it is more effective than positive reinforcement-based training. In fact, there is some evidence that the opposite is true. The researcher further concluded that it appears that aversive training methods have undesirable, unintended outcomes and that using them put dog, puts dogs' welfare at risk. In addition, there is no evidence to suggest that aversive training methods are more effective than reward-based training methods. The second review paper, also in 2017 by Guillermo Fernandez et al., um, entitled Do Aversive-Based Training Methods Actually Compromise Dog Welfare? What these researchers found after reviewing all the literature on dog training is that based on this review, we conclude that although currently there is limited scientific evidence on the effect of training methods on dog welfare, the existing literature indicates that, at least at some level, aversive-based methods generate stress in dogs. So as a summary from this section, um, from looking at all the studies that looked at the effects of training methods on dog welfare, all of these studies where the researchers were observing dogs during training found more stress-related behaviors in dogs that were trained with aversive-based versus reward-based methods. 
There's also some evidence in these studies that the verbal cues can themselves become aversive long term, even, even if the aversive technique is no longer used. Furthermore, all surveys that looked at this, the effects of training methods on welfare found an association between the use of aversive-based methods and aggression and other behavior problems. In terms of learning ability, all the studies that looked at that found lower obedience or ability to learn with the use of aversive-based methods. And they also found better obedience or ability to learn with, the, with more frequent use of reward-based methods. All right, so now we're moving on from these um, to the second broad category of research papers. Um, these ones looking at the effects of specific training methods on dogs. Um, and for this webinar, I'll be focusing only on the effects of shock collars. So in this study that, again, they used direct observation, meaning that the researchers were watching dogs as they were being trained, looking at the effects of the method on welfare. The study by Cooper et al. in 2014 was watching dogs as they were being trained on a recall task. In this study, there were three groups. In group A, dogs were being trained using a shock collar. And in groups B and C, the dogs were being trained on this recall task without the use of shock collar. However, dogs in group B were trained by trainers who were very experienced in the use of shock collars. So both trainers in both groups A and B had been nominated by the Electronic Collar Manufacturers Association as being experienced and good at what they do. Trainers in Group C were nominated by the APDT UK, which is an association for pet dog trainers in the UK that um, is, uses rewards-based methods only. What I want to say also about the shock collar group is that those trainers were told that they are allowed to use whatever make and model and intensity of shock that they deemed most appropriate. So basically using their judgment as they would with their clients. What I also want to say with a no shock collar group is that these dogs actually wore an inactivated shock collar so that when the researchers were watching the dogs being trained, they were blind to treatment. What that means is they couldn't tell whether that dog was actually being trained with a shock collar or not. And this is very important to eliminate any types of biases. So what these researchers found is that dogs in group A who were trained using a shock collar spend more time tense, they, spent, they did more yawning, and they spent less time interacting with the environment, all of which are indicators of stress. What they also found is that dogs in this group exhibited two times more panting and five times more yelping. And then looking at the yelping group, they found that yelping was more frequent with increasing intensity of shock. In terms of learning ability, because they also looked at that in this study, they found that overall there was no difference between groups and that overall 92% of the dogs improved on recall. However, what they did find after they follow up with the owners of these dogs who had been trained by these trainers is that owners of dogs who were trained using a shock collar reported being significantly less confident in using that method um, that had been used by the trainer on their own dogs. All right, moving on to another study, again, looking at dogs as they were being trained and the effects of the methods on welfare. In this study, researchers are watching dogs who are being trained for police or watchdog certificate. And these researchers evaluated both the short-term and the long-term effects of using shock collars. So looking at the short-term effects, the researchers observed dogs' immediate responses to shock delivery. What they found is that upon receiving a shock, 69% of the dogs lowered their ears, 56% displayed tongue flicking, 53% produced a high-pitched yelp, 44% displayed avoidance behavior, 41% squealed, 41% lowered their tail, 25% lifted their front leg. When they looked at some of the long-term effects of training with shock collar, they looked at dogs who were trained initially on these tasks with 
is a shock collar versus other aversive methods. And this little star here again is just to say that these dogs were already trained. So during this research, as the, as the researchers were collecting data, no shock was actually being applied. The dogs were compliant, but they had originally been trained using a shock collar or other aversive methods. And they observed these dogs while they were walking and as they were doing this obedience protection work and responding to commands. So during the walk, what the researchers found is that dogs who had originally been trained with a shock collar displayed lower ear position and more lip licking than the other dogs. During the obedience and protection work, again the dogs who had been trained with a shock collar had lower ear position, more tongue flicking, and more lifting of the front paw. What they did find too is that both groups of dogs um, were actually displaying high levels of lip licking, yawning, and turning away, all of which are stress-related behaviors. All right, so now we're moving on to, again, surveys, as a lot of the studies um, in the scientific literature are actually surveys, um, looking at the effects of using shock collars versus other methods on dogs' learning ability. So in this one study, uh, Blackwell et al. in 2012 found that people who reported having used a shock collar to train their dog also reported lower success with recall and chasing. And people who reported using more rewards in their training also reported highest success in training. I'm sure a lot of you are wondering about physiological data, so cortisol. Um, several studies have looked at urinary or salivary cortisol in their dogs in the context of training. Um, all of these studies found that there is an increase in cortisol in pretty much all the different groups that were used in these studies. The thing to understand is that cortisol is likely not an appropriate measure for studying the effects, the stress related to different training methods. The reason is that physiological data in general, including cortisol, indicates arousal but not valence. Here's what I mean by that. Generally, in the science of emotion, you can represent emotion on this bi-dimensional scale, where the first one is valence, so whether an emotion is negative or positive. The other dimension is arousal, whether the animal has low arousal or high arousal. So for example, depression would be something, was a negative valence emotion, something that's unpleasant with low arousal. In contrast, anxiety would be again a negative emotion with high arousal. On the positive side, we have a positive emotion with low arousal is an animal or person who's content versus a positive with high arousal is excited. So what we found is that physiological data such as cortisol, heartbeat, um, blood pressure are related to arousal, whether the animal is aroused but give us no information as to whether the experience is actually positive or negative. So for example, cortisol has been shown to increase in response to pain and distress, but it's also been shown to increase with physical activity and sexual activity, both of which are usually positive. So certainly during a training session where your dog is running and learning and is often excited, dogs are aroused and so you will have this increase in cortisol and so it really becomes very difficult to differentiate and kind of tease out this confounding effect of this of this running around and learning and excitement um, to have to whether it says anything about whether the dog is in a positive or negative effective state. So in summary, from this scientific literature on dog training, uh, for its effects on welfare, what we found by reviewing those studies is that every single study where researchers were observing dogs during training uh, reported some immediate effects of, of the shock collar um, by reporting yelping or other vocalizations in response to shock. They also, all these studies found uh, long-term negative effects of training with electric shock. So even if the, do the electric shock was no longer used, the dogs were still showing some stress-related behaviors when they were asked to perform things that they had been trained on using a shock collar. In terms of the effects of using shock collar and learning ability, all the studies found equal or worse learning ability with shock collars. So there really isn't that advantage that the shock collar um, seems to be more effective. 
So in conclusion, um, I want to bring up a study that was published just this year in 2018 by Zazie Todd, um, looking at the barriers to the adoption of humane dog training methods. In her introduction, this researcher asked, or said that the use of aversive dog training methods is associated with risks to animal welfare, and yet most dog owners continue to use positive punishment and negative reinforcement at least some of the time. And the big question that this researcher was addressing in this study is why? Why does that keep happening? What she found is that it mostly comes down to education. What she found is the sources of information that people use to train their dogs are often problematic. Um, we tend to look, to turn towards popular books or celebrities or some popular TV shows, or maybe looking at Facebook or other little social media things that are not backed by science, they're just hearsay. Um, and so that, those sources might not be the most reliable. It might be spinning some things that we now know are not true. Um, what she also found is when people were asked who their source of knowledge or who did they turn to, to to determine how to train their dogs, often they said myself. So basically they were training their dog based on what their opinion was of how they should train their dog. She also found that a lot of people would give up on using rewards. They started using these positive methods, um, but then getting frustrated and, and, and just reverting to resorting to use. A lot of people would start using rewards, but then they would get frustrated and they would resort to using some punish, positive punishment methods. And often it's because people, like the general public, are not always very good at recognizing their dog's body language. So they be, they might be missing this key communication that goes on between a trainer and a dog. Um, and because of this misunderstanding, they're not, they're not effectively training their dogs. Um, people often have very poor timing. We know that timing is very important in the use of aversive-based and positive-based me methods for the, law, for the dog to learn associations. Finally, this researcher also identified veterinarians as a possible missed opportunity. This is because one of the key authorities for dog owners is their veterinarian, but unfortunately, veterinarians are not trained on animal behavior or animal training. So we need to incorporate more of that into veterinary schools so that owners can have this conversation with their vet. Finally, and this is not in Zazie's paper, but I think another huge reason or huge obstacle to the implementation of using humane methods is human psychology. As humans, we have a strong reluctance to change. We love tradition. We've put value in tradition. We are proud of saying that we do something that was passed on to us from generation to generation. And unfortunately, the science on dog training has changed, has revealed new associations. Um, but some people keep using the methods that their grandfather taught them. The problem is also that when we are faced with new information um, that is contradictory to what we already believe, we have this cognitive dissonance, which means we have these two conflicting views in our heads and that's very distressing. And so we'll come up with all sorts of different explanations in our heads to justify the continued use of what we already believed in, um, to reconciliate that with what, what the new information that we're getting. We also have confirmation bias, which means that when we have a certain belief and we're confronted with, with information that goes against that belief, we tend to disregard it. Uh, we kind of ignore it, we forget it, we don't look at it. Whereas when we see information that confirms what we already believe, we focus on that and we're gonna talk about that, we're gonna tell other people and we're gonna remember this type of new info. So as final conclusion to this webinar, I hope that you have seen that the science is showing that humane training is both effective and better for dog welfare, and that barriers to adoption can be overcome with better resources for the public. And with Animal Kind, we do hope to become one of those resources that people can turn to in order to get better information, um, scientifically valid information. So thank 
you for listening and I just need to acknowledge all the partners that were involved in developing these standards. These include the UBC Animal Welfare Program, the Peter Wall Institute for Advanced Studies at the University of British Columbia, the Vancouver Foundation, as well as all of the external reviewers, as well as trainer survey consultation participants.